So I'm going to start with a couple of questions. How many of you are familiar with this person? OK, interesting. And does anyone know who this is? Ah, exactly. Well, one of these ladies is the most important mother of our times. Can you guess who that is? Well, that's Rosalind Elsie Franklin. Rosalind is referred to as the mother of DNA. She was the central figure in the discovery of its molecular structure. She's also one of many, many female scientists who for a number of years lived in the shadows of those who stifled their contributions. Now, I came across Rosalind when I was just a teenager, and she played a major role in my life because she was one of few female scientists that, were that was described in textbooks. Sadly, she was taken by cancer at a very young age, 37, probably because of the x-rays she was exposed to in labs. And yet, this incredible woman manages to inspire women in science to this day. Now, I want you to forget anything that you've ever heard about the story of DNA. And I want you to allow me to tell you how it really went down. Rosalind was born in London to a prominent Jewish family in 1920. And although women were somewhat rare entities at the time, she managed to gain a place at Cambridge to study chemistry. She eventually graduated from Cambridge with a PhD, and then she moved to Paris for postdoctoral research. There, she became an accomplished crystallographer. Her name actually resonated. She returned home to a position at King's College London in the biophysics unit to study the hot and quite mysterious DNA. Well, her colleagues were somewhat less charmed with the addition of a female on the, in their very male-dominated sphere. One of her colleagues even thought, he thought that she was brought on to be his assistant, and that was uh, Morris Wilkins. So needless to say, their relationship started off on the wrong foot, and it continued fraught throughout her stay. Now, after having developed the technology in the lab, Rosalind Franklin obtained a beautifully crystal clear X-ray diffraction image of a DNA fiber, the famous Photo 51. Now, that was an accomplishment, especially for a woman. As she was about to leave King's, her colleague Wilkins was visited by a young man the name of James Watson. James Watson was, uh, he was based in Cambridge, and he came down to London, met up with Wilkins, and Wilkins did something, well, he did something wrong. He actually revealed her discoveries to James Watson, and he showed in 50, uh, photo 51, excuse me. So the excited Watson went back to Cambridge, found his partner, Francis Crick, and he described these discoveries. He described photo 51. So the two of them were spurred on to build a model of DNA. We call that the double helix. Well, can you guess what happened then? The three groups went on to publish their work in the same journal, in the same month. But Rosalind's paper was placed right at the back, making it look like her paper was merely, merely supporting evidence. So in 1962, only four years after Rosalind died, the three others were awarded the Nobel Prize. You see, Rosalind, Rosalind died not ever knowing that Watson and Crick had seen her discoveries. And Watson and Crick failed to acknowledge her incredibly vital contributions. So this is a photo of that time. And it reminds me of a book that I had when I was a child, Where's Waldo? Do you know it? I think in the UK it's called Where's Wally? You see, I've been trying to locate a single female figure in this whole venue, let alone being awarded the Nobel Prize, and I can't seem to find one. Maybe they were at home cooking, who knows? But what gets me about the story is that she is still being haunted by hostility. Last year in an interview, Dr. Watson made a statement about, um, about uh, Rosalind, and he said, there's no reason to give her a Nobel Prize. She was a loser. Quite shocking. I mean, are you as shocked as uh, I am? Because I, I'm, I gotta tell you, I'm still trying to get over that one. But you see, it's evident from her story. Rosalind was a victim of what later became known as the Matilda effect, 
named after an early suffragette, Matilda Gage. So put simply, the Matilda effect is when a male counterpart takes the credit for the work of a female scientist. It's a thing. My own journey, well, my own journey is testament to the struggles that female scientists still face. When I was a child, my dream was to become a scientist. I was absolutely enthralled with the prospect of having the responsibility of driving evolution forward through research, discovery, knowledge. And so my, my formative years were in Greece, and I did well at sciences at school. But there was a place for me there. I never felt disadvantaged. And so 50 years after Rosalind made her discoveries, I was accepted on the molecular biophysics course at the Randall Center at King's College, the very same department where Rosalind made her discoveries. So, I mean, that was my ultimate dream come true, and I was blown away. I mean, I probably didn't sleep for about a week. <laughs> um, the thing is, though, I was the only female scientist on the course. My first job was in Athens. I was hired as a junior scientist at a biotech firm, and I quickly rose through the ranks. Everything was peachy till there. I was a happy camper. But then I moved abroad for work, and I started to notice a pattern. The pattern really shook me, because I was a blonde, fake blonde, <laughs> woman into her fashion. I was, I was being pushed towards sales roles, but I was a qualified scientist from credible institutions. I even had a peer-reviewed publication under my belt from my undergraduate years, which was highly unusual. At one job, they, um, they brought in a guy above me with fewer and less relevant qualifications. I was blamed for mistakes that on projects that I wasn't even a part of. Credit was given to others for my work. See, this experience really hit my confidence, and it started to make myself doubt that I was a credible scientist. You see, this is when I started to feel the effects of stereotype threat. In other words, I was being discriminated against because of my gender, and I wasn't being taken seriously as a scientist. <sighs> well, later on, I, I realized what had happened to me. I realized why I wasn't equipped to deal with the situation. Well, having grown up in Greece, I never really had to experience this. According to the latest survey from the OECD, well, Greece ranked second in the world for having the highest percentage of women studying science, studying STEM fields. STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering and Mathematics. And that was with only 0.08 of the country's GDP. That's nothing. You see, for me, it's evident that there's a cultural effect that's coming into play here. So let me give you some stats. Now, in academia, 75, out of 80 75 to 80 percent of uh, scientific research grants are awarded to men. The largest size of those grants are also given to men. A U.S. study in 2012 found that identical CVs with male names at the top were were uh, significantly favored over the same CVs with female names at the top. Interesting. Now, in earnings, again, women lag behind with earning 20% less than men do on average. But the, the shock came when we, looked at, when we looked at the age group of 55 plus, so with age and experience. Well, the gap was even larger with a 35% earning gap. Now, awards and competitions. The imbalance is even more staggering. Between 1901 to 2018, only 20 out of 606 Nobel Prizes were awarded to women in STEM fields. And only one woman has ever won the Fields Medal for Mathematics. So this brings me to my favorite inspirational story, and it's about a man, Pierre Curie. You see, when Pierre Curie heard that his wife, Marie Curie, wasn't going to receive the Nobel Prize for the discovery that they both shared, well, he stood up and he made things right. So Marie Curie went on to become the first ever woman to receive a Nobel Prize. And in fact, she didn't just win one Nobel Prize, she won two in her lifetime. 
The, the couple continued this culture into their family with their two daughters. Their eldest, Irene Curie, also became a scientist in her own right. And she, too, made significant discoveries which yielded her a Nobel Prize. So the family had four Nobel Prizes. You see, it's evident to me that we are doing mankind a great disservice by allowing discrimination and exclusion of women in science. Rosalind showed me the way back to science, and for that, I am eternally grateful. I'm in an honored position where I can make a difference through her name. In celebration of her centenary, King's College London and a team of incredible faculty members, as well as myself as an alumna, are working hard on a project we call Rosalind Franklin Meeting of Minds. Now, we're putting a roundtable of extraordinary people together so that we can raise visibility and increase the importance of, of the Randall Center, Rosalind Franklin, and women in science. We hope to raise funds for the center, and we hope to raise funds for studentships so that we can offer true equal opportunity. 2020 marks the centenary of Rosalind's birth. In those hundred years, can we say that we've made the same progress in gender equality in science as we have done in science itself? Well, apparently not. According to the World Economic Forum, it's going to take us 208 years to reach this point of equality. So I would say, let's follow in the footsteps of Pierre Curie and let's stand up and protect women, protect women that have been discriminated against, that have been excluded from science. Well, have a look in your network. See if there's a woman that's done something extraordinary that hasn't received the recognition that she deserved. Bring her out from the shadows and use social media for good. And hashtag my voice, my hero, and tell us her story. Who knows, she might just be worthy of a Nobel Prize. And if you're feeling a little bit braver, why don't you mastermind your own meeting of minds? Whatever the case is, give our voice volume and help us challenge the status quo so that one day in our lifetime, women like me won't have to tell stories about women like her. Now, I'm going to end on a positive note and uh, share with you the silver lining to our story. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce the very first female head of the Randall Center for Cell and Molecular Biophysics at King's College, Professor Franca Fraternali. Hi, Timmy, and hi, everybody. It is a privilege and honor for me as a woman and biophysicist to be leading the Randall Center for Cell and Molecular Biophysics, which is the descendant of the MRC unit in which Rosalind once worked. The scientific legacy of Rosalind is still alive in contemporary science. Modern technologies have in fact now made possible to sequence and compare individual DNA understand the molecular basis of disease, and even modify and transform DNA material. Rosalind would be proud to know that nowadays in the center there are many professors, women, and we are all committed to mentoring and to support young women who decide to pursue a career in science. We all share with Rosalind the passion for the mysteries of life. Thank you, Timmy, for contributing to that.